After nine videos, nearly an hour and a quarter, it's finally time to actually see if we've got any results worth writing home about. This is quite a long one. There's quite a lot uh, to go through, but it is important. So do take note of all the different things you've got to work with and find out about. We're going to define a lot more contrast, but for now we'll stick with just this single one we've got which should show us those voxels more activated by faces than by scrambled. So let's click done on that. We're asked if we want to apply uh, masking and uh, the options there are none, which is the default, uh, contrast, uh, image or atlas. So what masking is means um, masking off areas we're not interested in and you can mask off areas with another contrast that you've defined with a specific uh, image or using um, uh, an atlas of brain areas. We're not going to do any masking, we're doing default whole brain analysis, so we'll click none there. Now it says p-value adjustment to control. So we're going to use a standard 0.05 p-level. That is to say we only want to see those voxels which um, uh, in which we have a 95% confidence of, of a, a good model fit, that there's a, uh, a non-zero fit, and only a 5% uh, chance of, of, of getting this with random data. Of course, we're doing tens of thousands of simultaneous statistical comparisons, so this has to be uh, adjusted. The p-value has to be adjusted for all these multiple comparisons, and the way we tend to do it was, is with this FWE family-wise error. So when we say we want to use the FWE correction, we can then just use a normal 0.05 or 5% 1 in 20 threshold. The other threshold it wants to know about is the extent threshold. And this is so that we can choose to only show those um, significant voxels that are part of larger clusters of significant voxels. If we were to set this to 10, say, it would only show us those significant voxels that were adjacent to other significant voxels, at least 10 of them. We're not going to do that. We'll try showing uh, everything. We've got nothing to hide, we hope. And once we've done that, what we get is what's called a glass brain view of this uh, statistic. We have our design matrix here. We have the contrast, faces minus scramble. These are the five faces conditions for the five participants and the five scrambled conditions for the five participants. And this is a so-called glass brain view. Each view will show us uh, all uh, voxels in going into the screen. So in this top left sagittal view where we have um, the y-axis, the y-values um, going from anterior to posterior, uh, the Z values going from um, bottom to top, the uh, the X values go in and out of the screen. So whatever the laterality of something, it will it will show up um, in here. Uh, similarly, with this figure, we we can see things regardless of their, their Z value. So you can't just looking at this figure, you couldn't tell how high or low what the Z figure would be. Just looking at this figure, you couldn't tell if something was lateral or medial. Only by looking at least two of the images preferably three, you can get a sort of idea of what's going on. There's a lot going on here, so we need to take a moment to have a look around, see what we've got, and see what all the different menus do. We've already said we've got our design matrix, the contrast, and our glass brain view here. We've got some summaries here. The um, There's coordinates here of where this little red pointer is. If I uh, right-click I get some options. I can go to global maximum and this will jump the pointer to the voxel which has the highest um, T statistic and Z score. In fact when I did that you could see in the little table here this red became highlighted because that's where it is at location minus 40, minus 82, minus 6. I can actually click on a value in this table and you can see the little cursor jumps. It's an interactive table there, and you see the options that go to nearest supra threshold voxel, so nearest voxel, which is actually statistically significant, nearest local maximum or the global maximum. Um, and you can even uh, extract data in various ways, but we, we'll come to that later. So 
So we have here the, the coordinate where we're at. Um, this is a little summary of uh, telling us what we've got. The SPM is in the group stats directory, which we made. It says height threshold t equals, uh, what is it, just 4.86, something like that. And in brackets it says p is less than 0.05 um, FWE corrected. So what that means is that it's figured out that for this uh, brain shape and, uh, and smoothness, you would expect what you would expect to get by chance, and for in order that to be that that probability to be 0.05, the t statistic, the threshold needs to be 4.86 or so, and that's just shown up uh, a neatly a small number of voxels. Here it says extent threshold k equals zero voxels. Um, you would normally leave this at, at zero because if you raise it, then you're 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 hiding uh, data. Um, it's just if you've got quite messy data, a, 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 an individual voxel that is apparently statistically significant is unlikely because adjacent voxels are so highly correlated and a single voxel doesn't correspond to a, a, a single um, a brain structure or, or, or a neat area of, of processing. We've got a little summary table here which I'll come back to. Uh, it says here, table shows three local maxima more than eight millimeters apart. And we've got a little summary here. Again, it repeats what the height threshold is. It's only showing those voxels with this massive T-score. Um, but it's showing all of them, not those that just just those belong to certain clusters. It's saying the expected voxels per cluster, expected number of clusters. Um, it's showing, it's saying, um, it's, this is giving us a measure of the smoothness of the data. Now, this is not how much we smoothed it by, but it needs to calculate the smoothness of the data in order to figure out the correct uh, threshold for the statistics. And so whilst the, while the volume is 189,000 voxels, remember these are 2 millimeter square voxels, not the original 3 millimeter we started off with, because of the smoothness of the data, that's 1,762 resels or resolution elements. Because one resel is nearly 100 voxels. And we come to our table, and we're mainly interested in the voxel level statistics. It's not showing us every single uh, voxel here, um, but it's showing us the different clusters. And um, so this is a cluster. Uh, of 219 voxels and it's just showing us details of the three which have the highest t-score in this cluster then we have another cluster of 101 voxels and another cluster of just 18 voxels and this is the t-score this is what the equivalent z-score is this is the uncorrected p-value and then this is the corrected uh, according to our family wise error system this is another way this is p this is fdr correction false discovery rate correction a lot of these seem to come out at zero 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 because it only uses three digits after the decimal place one trick you can do is if you just um right click on something in the matlab window it it tells you what that number is so this one that says uncorrected p-value of 0 0.000. If I right click on it, it says it's 9.3769 e to the minus 12. That is 0 0.000000009. Very, very, no, I haven't done enough notes. That, that's very small. You can always get the data out. Okay, so that's just the quick summary in the figure window. Um, in this panel, we've got all kinds of things as well. Um, about the coordinates, the current statistic, which we already have here. Then we have some p-value panels, multivariate panel, and a display panel, and some menus. Um, the design menu we've already seen, that comes up when we just review our design. So if we wanted to, we could look at the design matrix in detail, or look at individual uh, regresses and sessions. For contrasts, we can change to a different contrast, which we don't have, we've only defined one so far, or create and define a new contrast, which we will do soon. We can change our significance level. You wouldn't often change it away from a corrected sensible threshold. Sometimes if there's a problem with data and it looks very messy, 
you um, change the threshold to something uncorrected just to see if when you change the threshold you get activation where you expect it but you wouldn't normally do that and again multiple displays if you've got more than one contrast which we haven't yet done this might look like just a couple of small blobs but it's actually a really good result and and, and what it's fantastic to get what would be bad is if we had absolutely nothing at all or lots of stuff all over the place because lots of stuff all over the place suggests you've done something terribly wrong with the analysis or you've got a really badly designed experiment typically you'll design a study in order to highlight a small region of processing and here this is exactly what we've got admittedly this is sort of the average effect across these five participants we can look uh, at them individually later but this is good data it'd be just nice to look at it in more detail um, perhaps visualize it a bit better than on this summary glass brain so if you look at the display panel in this figure um, you see it says we have the option to use overlays and on this menu list it says slices sections montage render um, what should we overlay it on well this data has all been normalized into standard space so if we wanted we could use uh, a canonical image uh, any image that's been warped into this space and here we've overlaid on slices so this gives us three transverse slices showing um, um, this particular slice here uh, we've got to have what we've got two millimeters apart and note the the, the color bar here um, of T values going from sort of red at zero up to white at sort of seven remembering that our height threshold is is nearly five anyway so all the statistically significant voxels uh, are going to be those which are sort of very bright yellow or white anyway what you've got to remember is this overlay is somewhat misleading because it's just some random person's brain that's been warped to the template and doesn't correspond to the average of our five participants brains or any one of those five people so if we start looking at this and saying oh it's just on the bank of that sulcus that's not the case if instead you overlay um, let's choose sections this time uh, going into the canonical on say the uh, average of 152 people this is this is more honest um, but of course it doesn't help so well uh, in, in localizing where your activation is in terms of boundaries between um, different regions note that unlike uh, the slices these sections are, are clickable and so we can jump around in here uh, and, and look at what we've got Um, also though now that we've got our overlays up that little table of data has disappeared um, it's nice sometimes to be able to see that as well what you can do is go to SPM figure and click on results table we get an empty figure for now but if we just go to this panel and under p-values click on whole brain uh, it's giving us the summary results for the whole brain so if I find somewhere to put that out of the way I could click on one of these and, and all the figures jump about to highlight these locations uh, all of them now uh, one thing to note is that we have this large cluster on the left and a few millimeters away from the, the peak voxel in that cluster we have a couple of other voxels it's very misleading when you've got the average of a few people's data to think that you've got one large region um, these could be the the peaks for different people and just the way the data has normalized they've ended up in slightly different areas we don't know yet if we've got good data from all participants or if there's uh, one or two who dominate all we know is this is the average now we've got this results table um, it's typically always almost impossible to read on screen if you right click on there um, you can uh, print out that out you can uh, extract that as a MATLAB data structure or you can export it as a, a text file comma separated values if you want to read that in to something else to Excel uh, for plotting or summarizing or tabulating the data so if I just extract the table data structure we'll find that we now have in MATLAB 
uh, a structure called table data which has a title as header format and it has the data in there so the table data dot data is a little celery with all those numbers in so if you want to get those numbers out because you need to do further analysis or summarize them somehow that again is not difficult to do that's it for now there is so much more to talk about there'll be a whole new series of videos um, but for now just explore what's available and always look at the SPM manual to see what else you can do